Chapter 19 The Chateau Thierry Salient The scene of 94 Squadron's operation now changes from the tool sector to the Chateau Thierry region. On June 27, 1918, all four of our American fighting squadrons were ordered to Chateau Thierry. We were now four in number, for Squadron 27, commanded by Major Harold E. Hartney, and Squadron 147, commanded by Major Bunnell, had recently completed training and had moved in alongside 95 Squadron and our little hat-in-the-ring squadron. Toul is a city of some 20,000 inhabitants and would be quite the metropolis of its region were it not for the larger city of Nancy, which lies but 15 miles east. It has certain quaint and interesting aspects, including a well-preserved and ancient moat and battlements which surround the old city, a picturesque plaza in the center of the town, and several venerable old buildings dating well back into ancient history. Moreover, Toul had shops and busy streets where overtired aviators could stroll about and make purchases and gaze upon the shifting crowds. Our new surroundings were of rather different character. We settled upon an old French aerodrome at Toucoin, a small and miserable village some twenty-five miles south of Chateau Thierry and the Marne River. The aerodrome was large and smooth and abundantly equipped with the famous French hangars, which consist of steel girders with walls and roofs of canvas. They were very spacious, quite cool in summer, and camouflaged admirably with the surrounding scenery. But no provisions had been made at Toucoin for the pilots and officers. All of our airplanes flew from Toul to Toucoin, while the rest of the aerodrome impedimenta was carted rapidly away to the new quarters in lorries, trucks, and trailers. The pilots of squadrons 27 and 147 were rather new at that time, and it was thought wise to assign some of the older pilots of 94 and 95 squadrons to the task of leading them through the air to the new field. I was assigned to fly Major Atkinson's Newport, and was directed to bring up the rear of the aerial procession, so as to keep an eye upon those who might fall by the wayside. I found that I had more than I could handle on that occasion. Lieutenant Buford of 95 Squadron had a reputation of scorning the use of a map in flying over France. He had been selected to lead the pilots of 27 Squadron to Toucoin on that morning. I saw him leave the ground with his twenty-odd machines and disappear in the distance. When I arrived at Toucoin, I learned that none of Lieutenant Buford's flight had yet put in an appearance. Late that night they all arrived safely. Upon being questioned as to their day's joyride, they told us that Buford's celebrated sense of direction had taken the entire squadron directly south instead of east. After flying until their fuel had given out, they all landed upon an aerodrome which at that moment fortunately appeared below them. Here they learned they were at Lyon, in the south of France, instead of Toucoin. After filling up with petrol and securing maps, they again set off and eventually arrived at their proper destination. Buford later had several very remarkable recurrences of this erratic homing instinct of his. Many instances occurred that illustrate how easily a pilot can be lost in the air, notwithstanding a clear sky and a brilliant sun shining in its proper position. A few days before we left Toul, I took Lieutenant Titman out for his first trip over the lines. Reed Chambers accompanied us, and we cautioned Titman to keep close alongside us, and in case of a battle to stay above us and simply look on without attempting to take any part. We had scarcely arrived over pont a when we discovered a Bosch photographic machine proceeding towards Nancy. Reed and I made a circumspect attack, both of us keeping one eye upon our new pilot and the other constantly searching the skies for fear some roving Fokker might pounce upon Titman while we were engaged with the albatross. The consequence was we lost our albatross and found that Titman had in the meanwhile implicitly obeyed instructions and had at no time been in any danger. Consequently, when another enemy plane appeared a few minutes later, Chambers and I rushed in to a vigorous attack, without very much concern for Titman's safety. Again, the enemy escaped, owing to the misfit of our cartridges with the resultant jamming of all four of our guns. We returned to pick up our protege and found that he had disappeared. Upon landing with very poignant fears concerning Titman, we were told that our balloon headquarters had telephoned in, stating that a Schoss machine had just gone down in flames a short distance north of Nancy. Our worst fears seemed confirmed. Reed and I felt much like murderers. Imagine our relief when a day or two later Titman came walking into our mess, told us rather shamefacedly that he had lost us during our combat and had decided to fly home and land. Although the sun was shining full in the south at noonday, Titman flew directly east. 
He had flown until his petrol had given out, and still had found nothing but trees below his sinking plane. With his heart in his throat, he let his new port take its own place for landing. One spot looked as fatal to him as another. He crashed in the treetops, rolled through the branches, and bounced upon the ground, his aeroplane in several fragments, but himself absolutely unhurt. After an hour's walk, which might easily have taken him into the Bosch camp, he found that he was very near the lines and but a few kilometers from Switzerland. Had his petrol lasted another five minutes, he would have landed there and had been interned by the Swiss authorities. Undeniably, there are several ways for airmen to get into trouble. Half a dozen of our group experienced motor trouble in that flight to Tuquan, and among them were some of the best pilots in our squadron. But all eventually arrived, eager to learn what new experiences this change of front would bring to us, and full of great expectations for the morrow. We found delightful quarters for ninety-four squadron's officers in an old abandoned chateau a few miles south of the field. It had been evacuated by its owners in 1914, when the Huns had made their first rapid advance beyond the Marne. Gorgeously furnished, and surrounded by wonderful scenery, it was by far the finest habitation a body of pilots ever found. Our regrets in leaving Toul were quickly banished when we found ourselves suddenly surrounded by all this beauty. Unfortunately enough, I had but little opportunity to enjoy its comforts, for during the greater part of our stay in this delightful spot, I occupied a cot in a nearby hospital where a bad case of pneumonia was narrowly averted. On the day of our moving from Toul, I had felt a return of the fever. Upon landing at Touquan, I realized that I had a serious chill. There was nothing for it but a report to the doctor. From June 28th to the 2nd of July, I lay by myself in a quiet room of the hospital, and there I did a deal of thinking. It was the first real opportunity for thinking things over I had found since the rush of war began. I had enlisted in the Signal Corps in New York, and the next day sailed with General Pershing for the front. From that day to this, I had always been striving for something that had seemed mythical and indefinite. I now determined to analyze the whole situation and try to catch up again with myself. Aviation had always been a mystery as well as a delight to me. The rush of an airplane through the sky awoke within me every instinct of sportsmanship and desire. With my rather intimate knowledge of motors and engines, I had always felt certain that I should find it easy to fly. My experiences in racing contests led me to believe that in the air, as on the race course, I should find a great difference in individual antagonists. Some of them would be better than I, some of them poorer. From all of them, I would be able to pick up, here and there, certain tricks and improvements which gradually might improve my own abilities. There was but one element in this game of war aviation that troubled me. Could I play my part in a life-and-death contest such as had been going on in the air over France for the past three or four years? Had these successful German, British, and French aviators a particular gladiatorial characteristic which made it possible for them to conquer in air combats, but which might be lacking in me? The answer to this question I did not know. I had begun my flying full of misgivings, full of a sense of my inexperience and incompetence. I had seen one cherished theory after another of mine go tumbling into space on my homeward journeys from my early combats. Through the favor of my lucky star, I had survived numerous incidents, incidents that had miserably terminated other pilots' careers. And now I had actually passed through a score or more of deadly combats on airplanes, had been victorious in several, and had escaped any injury whatsoever from the assaults of my adversaries. I wondered if I could not now begin to answer this perplexing question. Was I in that strange class of men who had plumbed the possibilities of danger in the air, who have mastered to the limits the powers of aeroplanes and aeroplane guns, who know that they are personally superior to their antagonists for this very reason, who are therefore superior in truth because of the self-confidence that this knowledge brings them. Cautiously and impartially I set my mind upon this problem. I felt that now was the time to make sure of myself for myself. If I could disabuse my mind of the impression that some mysterious power accounted for the successes of the famous air fighters of the enemy service, I would be able to meet them with far greater confidence in my own merely human powers. I reviewed the various combats in which I had taken a part. Here and there I detected mistakes that I had made, mistakes of which I should never again be guilty. Over and over again I had failed to get a victory because of a stupid jamming of my guns. Was there no way of removing the sorry impediment? I would examine every single detail of my guns myself in the future. Every cartridge that the armorers gave me would receive a strict examination and testing before I left the field. That would certainly minimize the possibilities of gun failures at critical moments. 
Next, the principal fear that hampered me in the midst of a combat was the knowledge that the new poor's wings might give way under the stress of a necessary maneuver. Constantly I was limited in essential movements by this fear. Was there no way to strengthen these wings? Why couldn't we get the spots that had been promised us? If I could only get a machine built according to my own designs. I imagined how I could throw terror into the enemy formations if I could only hurl my machine about them with the headlong impetuosity that I craved to let go. I lay staring at the ceiling for some time, picturing myself in pursuit of the whole German air force who were fleeing in terror before my ideal airplane. Then with a shrug I pulled myself together and forced myself once more to face the realities. My gun jammings I could and would remedy. There was no reason why I should not have less jams than any other pilot in the service, provided I put adequate attention to the matter. The limitations of my Newport I must bear in mind, and endure them until the authorities found means to procure spots for us. Above all, I must constantly remember to remain within those limitations, even if the enemy escaped me. Otherwise I should never live to continue to fight within the pilot seat of the coveted spod. I thought of the insolence of the high-flying rumplers, with a return to my craving for an airplane of my own design. My old friend, number 16, of the Rising Sun Squadron. How I should love to give him a little surprise on our next meeting. I would design a fighting plane that would fly faster, that would outclimb, outdive, and outmaneuver any machine or machines that the Bosch owned. And it would have a higher ceiling than the rumpler. It was all possible, if I could only get it done. The result of my long cogitations and self-study was a determination to begin afresh my career in the air. I convinced myself that I had fairly well solved the puzzles that had deterred me from several successes in my more immature past. Merely human qualities dominated aviators after all. I had seen enough of the Bosch tactics by now to understand that there surely was no mystery about them. Caution was one very essential element that I must never forget. With that determination I dropped to sleep and awoke with a feeling that a great load had been lifted from my mind. On July 4th, a day which the Americans intended to celebrate in Paris with much magnificence, I obtained permission to visit the capital. Captain Kenneth Marr and several of our pilots went in with me to see the celebration. They returned early the following day, leaving me to take my own time in rejoining my squadron. Hardly had they gone when the impulse came to me to go down to Orly, where the American Experimental Aerodrome was located and see for myself just what the situation was in regard to our spod aeroplanes. I called upon the Major in charge of the supply depot, and there learned to my delight that he had actually begun arrangements for the immediate equipment of the Hat in the Ring squadron with the long-deferred spods. At that moment, he told me, there were three spods on the field that were designated for our use. With rather a short farewell to the Major, I hastened to the field, and there I found three of the coveted fighting machines that I knew had many accomplishments superior to the rival Fokkers. The nearest machine to me had the initial figure I painted on its sides. I asked the mechanics in charge if this machine had been tested. Yes, sir, all ready to go to the front, was the reply. Is this one of the machines belonging to 94 Squadron? I inquired. Yes, sir, there are two more over there. The others will be in here in a few days. Well, I am down from 94 Squadron myself. I continued, a sudden wild hope entering my brain. Is there any reason why this machine should not go to the squadron today? None that I know of, sir, the mechanic answered, thereby forming a resolution in my mind that I very well knew might lead me to a court-martial, provided my superior officers chose to take a military view of my offense. Inside ten minutes I was strapped in the seat of the finest little spa that ever flew French skies. I have it to this day and would not part with it for all the possessions in the world. Without seeking further permission or considering stopping to collect my articles at my hotel, I gave the signal to pull away the blocks, sped swiftly across the smooth field, and with a feeling of tremendous satisfaction I headed directly away for the Tuquam Aerodrome. Not until I had landed and begun to answer the questions of my comrades as to how I got possession of the new machine did I begin to realize the enormity of the offense I had committed. I did not contemplate with any pleasure the questions that the commanding officer would hurl at me on this subject. But, to my joy, no censure was given me. On the contrary, I was given this first spot to use as my own. Within an hour my mechanics were fitting on the guns and truing up the wings. In the meantime, I decided to go out for the last time on my old-time mount, the Newport. During my absence the group had suffered two losses and had won three victories. 
Lieutenant Wanamaker of 27th Squadron, was from my home city of Columbus, Ohio, and he, I learned, had gone out on patrol on the 3rd of July and had been shot down above Chateau Thierry. For weeks we feared he had been killed, but finally received word from the Red Cross in Switzerland that Wanamaker had merely been forced down within enemy territory and had been captured unhurt. It was at this period of the American offensive, it will be remembered, that the final German retreat began at Chateau Thierry. Our aerodrome at Touquin was located so far behind the lines that we were limited to very short patrols over enemy territory. As the Hun continued to withdraw farther and farther back, it was evident that we must abandon our magnificent chateau at Touquin and move nearer the front. Every day the German rumplers came over our field and blandly photographed us while our Archie batteries poured up a frantic lot of useless shells. I doubt if the enemy remained in ignorance of our change of locations a single day, for as soon as we began settling at the Saints Aerodrome a few miles nearer the lines, we again noticed the visits of the high-flying rumplers. In fact, one of our squadron pilots, who was captured at this period, later told me, after his release, that the German intelligence officer exhibited to him a full list of the names of all of our pilots. The officer kindly inquired after the health of Major Hartney, who had seen distinguished service with the British before joining the American Air Service, and then he asked if Rickenbacker had been formulating any new balloon plans. Since the only plan that I had ever formulated was the ridiculous failure of our balloon attack of the week previous, I naturally felt somewhat aggrieved at this officer's low humor but it astonished me to learn of the precise information possessed by the enemy in regard to our movements and personnel. My feelings were somewhat restored by hearing of the opinion the same officer expressed as to the efficacy of the American air fighters. Before one can appreciate the significance of his remark, it is necessary to understand the character of the famous German fighting squadrons who now confronted us. Chapter 20 The Death of Quentin Roosevelt the German advance, beginning late in June, had resulted in forcing a deep salient in the lines between Soissons and Rennes. These two cities lie on an east and west line. Both are situated on the Vesle River, but twenty-odd miles separate them. Rennes, to the east, had withstood the assaults of the Hun, but Soissons and the important highways and railroads centering there were now held by the Germans. Straight south from Soissons, the trenches now ran south for twenty miles until the banks of the Marne River were reached. Then they curved northward and east, the belligerents facing each other from the opposite sides of the river almost to Epernay, a city almost directly south of France. Thus the salient which now most threatened Paris and the region south of the Marne was approximately twenty miles deep and twenty miles wide. It included Chateau Thierry, which lay on the north bank of the Marne. Our aerodrome at Touquin lay south another twenty miles from Chateau Thierry. In that position, we were then south even of the city of Paris itself. With full knowledge of the increasing strength of the American army in France, and having decided to stake all upon one last effort before the arrival of our troops in their entirety, the Hun commanders had then even stripped the able-bodied men from their munitions factories throughout Germany in order to secure a victory at the front before it became too late. The loss of these factory workers spelled an ultimate failure in the supply of munitions of war necessary to a long campaign. If this last desperate thrust failed, the Bosch must admit themselves defeated. The subsequent breakdown of the German army was the natural climax to this desperate strategy. This last drive for Paris and Amiens must be the last. Every ounce of energy was therefore expended. Every division and every squadron of aviators that could be spared from other sections of the front were hurriedly concentrated upon these two districts, that of Chateau Thierry, and the saint quentin to Amiens district. When the orders came to 94 Squadron to shift from Toul to this new Chateau Thierry sector, the German fighting squadrons had already left the vicinity of Verdun, saint Mihiel, pont a mousson Only the regular photographing and observing machines were still abroad there for our entertainment. Arrived at our new quarters, we found a very different situation. Our entertainment here promised to be fast and furious enough to suit the most ambitious airmen. It was quickly discovered by our own intelligence officers that the best of the German fighting squadrons were now patrolling our skies. Captured prisoners, the markings on the planes we shot down, the photographs and observations of our airmen and other sources which are employed to gain this information, all told the same story. On the aerodrome at Quancy, a large field just north of Chateau Thierry, was located the distinguished Richthofen squadron, then commanded by Captain Reinhardt. 
Its machines were distinguishable by their scarlet noses and by the extraordinary skillfulness of their pilots. It was now included in Jagstoffel No. 1, which comprised four flights of seven machines each. Jagstoffel No. 2 was a scarcely inferior aggregation of German aces under a command of Captain Leuscher, himself a victor over forty-two aerial antagonists. The aeroplanes of his squadron were also Fokkers. Instead of the scarlet markings on nose and wings, Number 2 Jagstoffel had the belly of each fuselage painted a bright yellow. These machines occupied the same field with the Richthofen Circus. The third famous fighting squadron of the Germans, Jagstoffel No. 3, was at that time under command of Captain Batange, an air fighter celebrated in Hunland not only for his twenty-five victories, but for his great success as a trainer of adroit air fighters. This squadron occupied an aerodrome back of saint Quentin. While usually engaged with British antagonists further north, this squadron frequently made its appearance opposite us during the hottest days of fighting in our sector. Thus it became evident to us that we American aviators were at last to meet the very choicest personnel of the enemy air forces. Not only would these experienced pilots be mounted upon superior machines, but they had been trained to fly in such close formations that they need fear no attack until they themselves were ready to accept combat. And they had consolidated here in such numbers that every time we crossed the lines we found the sky full of them. Ninety-four squadron at that time had seventeen pilots and twenty-four aeroplanes available. Squadrons ninety-five, number twenty-seven, and number one forty-five had approximately the same number each. No other American fighting squadrons were then assisting us in the defense of this sector. Without desiring to make any reflection upon the French airmen who were stationed near us in this sector, it is necessary to show that the state of French morale was at that time notoriously bad. Indeed, it would have been strange after four years of severe warfare to have found that personnel in France had not suffered enormously, as in the other fighting countries. After the loss of the eager volunteer for aviation, it became necessary to press into that service men who much preferred the infantry, cavalry, or artillery. As was to be expected, the resultant air force of France did not measure up to its former prestige. Consequently, the few American squadrons who were suddenly plunged into the thick of this ferocious conflict at Chateau Thierry found that they were overwhelmingly outnumbered, poorly supported, and lamentably equipped, both in machines and experience. When, therefore, I later learned that the intelligence officer of the enemy air force had complimented the American pilots by saying that they fought more like Indians than soldiers, and that they upset all our training by dashing in single-handed against our formations. I felt a great glow of pride and confidence in the bravery our boys exhibited throughout that trying campaign. The losses in our group during the four weeks we occupied this sector at Chateau Thierry amounted to thirty-six pilots, who were either captured or killed. Among the latter class was Quentin Roosevelt, who fell in flames on July 14, 1918. Our victories during this same period were thirty-eight, two more than the number we had lost. Quentin Roosevelt's death was a sad blow to the whole group. As President Roosevelt's son, he had rather a difficult task to fit himself in with the democratic style of living which is necessary in the intimate life of an aviation camp. Everyone who met him for the first time expected him to have the airs and superciliousness of a spoiled boy. This notion was quickly lost after the first glimpse one had of Quentin. Gay, hearty, and absolutely square in everything he said or did, Quentin Roosevelt was one of the most popular fellows in the group. We loved him purely for his own natural self. He was reckless to such a degree that his commanding officers had to caution him repeatedly about the senselessness of his lack of caution. His bravery was so notorious that we all knew he would either achieve some great spectacular success or be killed in the attempt. Even the pilots of his own flight would beg him to conserve himself and wait for a fair opportunity for victory. But Quentin would merely laugh away all serious advice. His very next flight over enemy lines would involve him in a fresh predicament from which pure luck, on more than a few occasions, extricated him. A few days before his death, Quentin Roosevelt went over the lines with his formation, and they came home without him. Later he arrived and laughingly announced that he had shot down his first Hun machine. Upon being questioned about the combat, he admitted that he had been lost after striking off by himself to investigate a large formation of enemy machines, which he had discovered in the distance. Resolving to be prudent in the matter, he reversed his direction after discovering they numbered over twenty to his one. He flew about alone for a while, then discovering, as he supposed, his own formation ahead of him, he overtook them, 
dropped in behind, and waited patiently for something to turn up. It came about fifteen minutes later. His formation continued almost straight ahead during all this time, he following quietly along in the last position. Quentin had no idea where they were headed and didn't care. He had violated his duty once by leaving them, and now he intended blindly to follow the leader. Meditating thus, he failed to notice that the leader had dipped a signal and had begun to virage to the left. Quentin awoke just in time to see the aeroplane ahead of him suddenly stick his nose up and begin a virage. Then to his horror he discovered that he had been following an enemy patrol all the time. Every machine ahead of him wore a huge black Maltese cross on its wings and tail. They were as unconscious of his identity as he had been of theirs. Quentin fired one long burst as he in turn completed the virage and rejoined the formation. The aeroplane immediately preceding him dropped at once and within a second or two burst into flames. Quentin put down his nose and streaked it for home before the astonished Huns had time to notice what had happened. He was not even pursued. It was this style of Indian warfare that had moved the German intelligence office to state that their training was indeed hopeless against the Americans' recklessness. German formation flying was admirable until an American joined it and maneuvered in concert with it for fifteen minutes before shooting it up. One can imagine the disgust of the methodical Bosch as they digested this latest trick of the Yank. Lieutenant Quentin Roosevelt met his death during an unusually severe dogfight in the air. He left the aerodrome with his formation of five planes and proceeded across the lines east of Chateau Thierry. The sky was thick with enemy formations, as usual. Both our own and the enemy's aeroplanes were largely engaged at that time in strafing trenches and the main highways upon which the columns of troops were continually advancing to occupy the lines. One did not have to seek far to find a fight. Within ten minutes after crossing the trenches, the little formation from 95 Squadron took on a Fokker formation of seven machines. They were both at a low altitude, and evidently both were intent upon discovering a favorable ground target covered with marching men. The five Americans accepted the Hun challenge for combat and dropped all other business for the time being. During the rapid circling about in which both groups were endeavoring to break up the formation of the antagonist, Quentin discovered the approach of another flight of red-nosed Fokkers coming from above and behind. He withdrew by himself and flew ahead to meet the newcomers, climbing as he flew. The others were utterly unconscious of his departure, since Quentin flew in the last rear position on one of the wings. It was a cloudy day, and the airplanes were up near to and occasionally lost in the obscurity of the clouds. Suddenly Lieutenant Buford, the leader of Quentin's formation, saw a Newport falling through the clouds from above him. It was out of control as it swept by him. Without realizing whose machine it was, Buford knew that an enemy force was above him. He already had more than his hands full in the present company. Signaling his pilots to follow him, he broke off the contest and recrossed the lines. Then he discovered the absence of Quentin Roosevelt. That same night a wireless message came from the Germans saying that Quentin had been shot down by Sergeant Tom of the Richthofen Circus. Tom, at that time, had a record of twenty-four planes to his credit. The additional information was received that Quentin had been buried with military honors. No honors, however, could have compensated our group for the loss of that boy. The news was flashed throughout the world that Quentin Roosevelt was dead. Occasional press reports came to us that some imaginative reporter had stated that perhaps he was not in reality killed, but was merely a prisoner, thereby selling several more papers while unnecessarily distressing a bereaved family with utterly false hopes. A story came to my attention later which deserves a drastic reply. New York newspapers gave wide publicity to a statement made by a certain non-combatant named Hungerford, who claimed to have been employed on the Chateau Thierry sector of the front at this time. He not only attempted to describe the fight in which Quentin Roosevelt lost his life, but even intimated that had Quentin's comrades not fled, thereby leaving Quentin alone against desperate odds, the whole German formation might have been destroyed. He stated that he saw the fight and that Quentin, before his sad death, actually shot down two of the enemy planes. This whole story is absolute piffle. Nobody saw Quentin's last fight except the Huns, who shot him down. The fight itself occurred ten miles back of the German lines, over fer en tardin Quentin did not shoot down two enemy planes, nor did his comrades desert him in time of trouble will be very unhealthful for Mr. Hungerford to meet the members of 95 Squadron upon their return to New York. A more gallant lot of boys never came to France, as this non-combatant gentleman will discover when he meets them. During all this time I had been practically out of the fighting at the front. I had made but two flights over the lines at Chateau Thierry, 
one on my old Newport and the second on my Spod. On neither expedition did I meet an enemy airplane, nor was I anxious to do so until I had quite mastered the tricks and wiles of my new Spod. On July 10th I became suddenly aware of a sharp pain in my right ear. It grew worse, and I decided to have the squadron doctor look me over. He sent me to Paris by the next train to have the eardrum lanced. An abscess had formed which might prove dangerous. Thus I was again forced to fret and turn upon a hospital bed for several days while my squadron was going through with the most severe trials in its short experience. Doug Campbell was away, leaving Jimmy Meisner, Reed Chambers, Alan Winslow, and Thorne Taylor, the principal stars of our organization. I used to lie in my bed and wonder how many of these old comrades would greet me when I returned to my aerodrome. On July 15th, while lying half asleep on my bed in the hospital, I was suddenly startled by a tremendous explosion outside my windows. The nurses soon came by with frightened expressions on their faces. I asked one what it was. "'It was one of the long-distance shells the Bosch are again firing into Paris,' she said. "'They began that when they were about to start their great offensive of March 21st. For some time they have not been shooting into Paris. Now that it begins again, it is certain that they are commencing another drive.' The young Frenchwoman was right. The very next day we heard that the long-anticipated drive from Chateau Thierry had begun. The heavy artillery barrage had started at midnight, and the offensive upon which the Germans were founding all their hopes was now on. It was, in fact, the beginning of the end of the war. Nobody realized it, of course, but General Falk, who possessed exact information of just when and where the Huns would strike, had prepared for it by crowding in immense quantities of artillery from Chateau Thierry to Rennes from Rons on eastward to the Argonne Forest. Just two hours in advance of the first German shell, he began such a terrific barrage over the lines that the enemy forces were completely disorganized. They were never again to threaten Paris or the Allied armies. And then the second division of the American army began their great drive at the top of Chateau Thierry salient at Soissons, while the French began to pinch in the line at Rons. All that great area of twenty miles by twenty was crammed with German troops, German artillery, German supplies. It must be moved at express speed to the rear, or all would be captured. Our squadrons at this great period did tremendous work in strafing the main highways leading to the Germans' rear. One of the pilots of 27 Squadron, Red Miller of Baltimore, who was shot down and captured while on one of these highway strafing expeditions, later described to me the extraordinary scenes he passed through while being taken to the rear under guard. It was Red Miller, in fact, who had been confronted with the complete list of names of all our squadrons by the German intelligence office. They questioned him immediately about his name, his squadron, and many other details which they were foolish enough to think they could tempt out of him. Miller, of course, had an enjoyable half-hour, stuffing them with the most marvelous stories that a Baltimore education could invent. In his march to the prison camps that night, Miller was conducted up the main highway from Chateau Thierry to the north. Two Bosch cavalrymen rode on horseback, and he trotted along on foot between them. American shells were falling thick upon this road, and at every burst Miller and his conductors expected to be hurled among the dead and dying who filled the ditches. The road was literally jammed with horses, lorries, guns, and men. All were hurrying northwards. Along the sides of the roads, hundreds of Bosch soldiers were detailed to drag from the roadway those men, trucks, horses, and guns which had been struck by American shrapnel, and which lay there obstructing the traffic. Ropes were hastily attached to these obstructions, and they were pulled out of the way and dumped by the roadside. Another gang of soldiers worked side by side with these men, filling as quickly as possible the holes in the highway made by these exploding shells. Everything was hurry, noise, dust, and confusion. In a nearby hospital lay Lieutenant Norton, a dear friend and neighbor of mine from Columbus, Ohio. Norton had been wounded and fallen within the German lines. He was taken to the nearest hospital at Ferrantadon, where he received good treatment until the day of the American drive. He was abandoned with all the other wounded by the fleeing Germans. When the Americans reached this hospital three days later, Norton had died from neglect. An amusing as well as heroic exploit of Miller's during this fearful march of his to the rear is well worth recording here. Red was so mortified by his capture, so exhausted by his continuous trot between his two captors, and so scared by the constant shelling of the road over which they were passing, that he resolved to break away from his two captors and risk their bullets rather than continue indefinitely in his present plight. It was getting dark as they passed a small piece of woods to the right. Red suddenly stopped and bent over to lace up his boots. 
the two horsemen shot a glance at him, then seeing he was innocently engaged, drew up their horses and waited for him. As soon as the right-hand horse had passed him, Red straightened up and jumped for the nearest trees. He dashed through the brush in the darkness, scratching his face and tearing his clothes, but did not hear that a single shot had been fired at him. He stopped and was peering about for a suitable tree in which to spend the night, hoping that by morning the country would be cleared of Huns, when an electric torch was flashed into his face. He threw up his hands and surrendered, finding that he had stumbled full into a camp of Hun artillery. When his captors again recovered him, Red fully expected to be shot for attempting to escape. Imagine his surprise when they begged him not to tell anybody about his escapade. They feared they would receive a worse punishment than he, because of their carelessness in permitting him to escape. Chapter 21 Flying Circus Scores Heavily It was not until July 31st that I was able to mount my spod and again take my place in fighting formations. Even then I started out with much apprehension, for the doctors had told me that it was highly improbable that I should ever be able to fly again, owing to the condition of my ear. To my delight, I found that no ill resulted from this trial flight, and I put my machine through all sorts of acrobatics, and landed with the satisfaction of knowing that I had fooled the doctors and was as good as new, in spite of my punctured ear. That was a day of terrible losses to our group. Every squadron lost heavily, but the severest loss to the group was borne by Squadron 27. Lieutenant John MacArthur of Buffalo, New York, had up to that date destroyed five enemy machines in combat, and promised to be one of the greatest fighting airmen in the American army. Everyone who knew him admired him immensely, and the pilots who had flown over the lines with him looked upon Jack MacArthur almost with reverence. He was cautious, quick, a clever pilot, and a dead shot. His judgment was good, and he had every attribute that spells success. His example had made a wonderful organization out of the new pilots of Number 27. Early in the morning of July 31st, MacArthur led out his crack formation of six planes to try a strafing expedition upon the aerodrome and hangars of the Richthofen Circus, which had just moved back from Quancy and now occupied the aerodrome north of Feem. From this expedition, only one of the formation ever returned. Not until weeks later did we hear any news of this missing five. Then came a letter from one of them telling us what had occurred. They had reached their objective without mishap and had strafed the hangars and billets of the Richthofen crowd until their ammunition was gone. Whether or not any of the enemy machines came up to fight them, we did not learn, but the Richthofen aerodrome was twenty miles inside the lines, and our aerodrome was thirty miles this side of the lines. When the strafers turned their noses homewards, they found a forty-mile wind against them. They had already been out over an hour, and could hardly hope to reach the home field against this gale, before their fuel would be exhausted. They might easily reach some nearer aerodrome, on our side of the lines, however, and towards this object they set their minds. Halfway to the lines, they encountered several formations of enemy planes who were fully aware of their predicament and were waiting for them to come out. Up and down, back and forth, MacArthur led his little formation, seeking for a place to break through the enemy's ranks. Finding the Bosch pilots too adroit for him, he finally resolved to break through, regardless of the tremendous odds against him. MacArthur led the attack, and like Horatius of old, he embraced all the spears in his own breast to enable his comrades to pass through them. He fell, killed in air, and one of his pilots fell beside him. But even this heroic sacrifice was in vain. The remaining three pilots of his formation passed the encircling enemy machines only to find that this protracted maneuvering had quite exhausted their fuel. One by one their motors spluttered and died. The entire formation dropped to earth, some landing safely, others crashing in shell holes, all of them finding themselves behind the German lines. Squadron 94's greatest loss on that fatal day was Alan Winslow, the Chicago boy who had the honor of bringing down the first enemy machine conquered by the pilots of the Hat in the Ring squadron. Winslow was a gallant lad and one of the most popular men in the squadron. Late that evening he was seen by another member of his flight diving down upon a Fokker with which he had taken on a combat. The two machines continued downwards until the dusky ground swallowed both of them from view. The rest of Winslow's flight returned home, and long did we sit up, waiting for news of old Allen that night. The pilots stood about under the stars, popping up very lights into the clear sky, hoping that he might see the signal from afar and come roaring in. To every war pilot, there is an extraordinary pathos about the flashes of these distant signal lights at night. 
I never see these bright balls of fire cut through the night sky without feeling a clutch at my heart, without remembering the anguish with which I have watched and waited and hoped for the return of some dear comrade in answer to their signal. They rush from the mouth of the pistol with a noise like that of a child's pop-gun. The silvery ball climbs upward two or three hundred feet with a soft roar. There it gracefully curves in its trajectory and begins slowly to fall, shedding a powerful light upon the surrounding landscape and casting its beckoning signal for a score of miles around. On any fine night, as one flies homeward from the lines, these very lights strike the eye from every aerodrome, both friendly and hostile. To a member of the mess, they denote a warm welcome from his comrades. To a stranger comes the significant intimation that yonder some member of an expectant family is still missing. A month later, one of the members of our squadron met in London Alan Winslow's brother, Paul Winslow, a member of the most famous of Great Britain's fighting squadrons, number 56. Asked if any news had been received of Alan, Paul Winslow replied simply, He went west. Upon returning to the squadron, however, a letter was found awaiting him from Alan Winslow himself. He wrote from a German hospital, stating that he had been wounded in the combat, had received a bullet in the left arm which had shattered it. The arm was amputated above the elbow, and he was quite contented to find himself so well out of the occurrence. The sorrows, the surprises, the joys of war-flying are legion. The next day, after the fall of Alan Winslow, a formation was sent out from our squadron, under the leadership of Lieutenant Loomis, to protect a photographing expedition of three French Breguet machines. Although far from being in condition, I resolved to tag along behind them in my spod and see what happened. I got to an altitude of 15,000 feet, which was about 5,000 feet higher than the others, and from this front row in the gallery I had a wonderful view of an amazingly interesting little scrap. The Breguet had not proceeded very far into Germany before a Fokker formation appeared upon the scene. Of course the Fokkers saw the Newport, but they also saw the Breguet, and the German pilots knew that those Breguet with their photographs were the important targets for their flaming bullets. I sat above them and followed them in the various maneuvers to get in between Loomis and his convoy. Back and forth they circled, all the members of both formations keeping always in their proper positions. Although the Fokkers were seven to the new poor's five, the former did not appear very desirous of forcing a way through them to get at close quarters with the Frenchmen. Thus maneuvering, the whole circus passed further and further along into Germany, until they gradually neared the landscape which the French machines wished to photograph. This objective was the city of Fiume, the railroads and highways leading into it, and the positions of any batteries of artillery that might be concealed from the naked eye, but which could scarcely escape revealment by the powerful lenses of the cameras. Plenty of other airplane formations were in the vicinity. I discerned hostile planes and friendly planes, American, British, and French. It was evident that the Fokkers below desired to attract to their aid one or more of their adjacent squadrons before attempting to force a battle with 94's Newport. Lieutenant Loomis, on his part, had no desire to press matters. His instructions were to defend the Breguet, not to take on any combats that happened to offer themselves. If the Fokkers refused to come in and attack them, Lieutenant Loomis's formation would have no fighting to do. I watched the distant enemy formations with considerable interest, ready to fly in and give warning should any one of them make a move to attack Loomis. But they apparently had their hands full watching out for their own safety, for the further we moved into German territory, the thicker did we find the sky filled with cruising airplanes. Only a little rumpus was needed to start one of the choicest dogfights that ever was seen. With much amusement, I noticed that our Frenchmen were now over Fiume and had begun taking their photographs. Evidently the Fokker leader discovered their industry at the same moment I did, for with a curt dip to his wings he started his flight on a headlong dive in the direction of the Breguet. But Loomis was then ready and anxious for the fight. Enough photographs had been taken to relieve him of the responsibility of spoiling the fun of the Frenchman. Quickly he reversed his direction, all his flight falling neatly into position, and leaving the froggies in the lurch, he swept forward to engage with the Fokkers. The latter seemed rather startled for a moment, wavered a bit in their course, and in the next instant the fight was on. The Americans had the advantage from the first, for Loomis had kept his Newport at a good altitude above the Breguet, and the Fokkers had tried to attack them from below. Loomis dived steadily at the tail of the nearest Fokker. This latter had no course open but to try and outdive him. 
Another Fokker got on Loomis's tail, and another Newport followed on his tail. Soon the whole menagerie was streaming along in this fashion, every machine pouring streams of tracer bullets into the machine ahead of him. It was a splendid spectacle to witness, but I knew it would be of short duration. One Fokker had already dropped towards earth, and two of our bright-colored Newport were streaking it for home in the wake of the disappearing brigade. Either these two pilots had wounds or engine trouble, or else considered the wisest policy was to get out of this hurricane of flaming bullets. I looked for Loomis. There he was, way down below, with three Fokkers on his tail. He was vainly attempting to reform his scattered formation, and but two of his machines remained. Even as I watched them, I saw several other enemy machines drawing nearer them from the north. It was high time to get down to their aid. As I dropped down to their vicinity, I saw Loomis fire three or four short bursts at his antagonists, and then, swerving away to the south, he put on the sauce and rapidly drew away from the pursuit. His pilots had fortunately observed his departure and hastened to overtake him. The Fokkers kept up a short pursuit, then seeing me above them, feared they were getting into another ambush, and the next moment were diving with all speed to the protection of their own landing field. I was frankly glad to let them go, for after three weeks' absence I felt little inclined to take on anything against odds. Turning back to join my fellows, I was startled to discover that Loomis was very plainly sinking to earth. His propeller was slowly turning, and I knew instinctively that he had been struck in some vital part of the engine. I overtook him and quickly measured the distance that separated him from the distant trenches, he was only seven or eight thousand feet above the ground, and the lines were some six miles distant. Evidently he was fully aware of the tightness of his predicament, for he was nursing along his powerless airplane, and sailing on as flat a level as the Newport could possibly maintain. Generally speaking, an airplane can sail along for a mile without losing more than a thousand feet altitude. Thus, Loomis could make eight miles without engine power, provided he were eight thousand feet above ground provided also that no contrary wind was blowing him backwards during this time, and also providing that no rifle and machine-gun bullets were able to terminate his progress as he drew nearer and nearer to the ground. I flew above him, absolutely powerless to do more than wish him luck. Archie took up the chase with malevolent delight, and sprayed both of us impartially with shrapnel. I lost all interest in the angry bursts about me, in the complete fascination of Loomis's struggle for the lines. He was holding on to every inch of his altitude, with the skill of a Cape Cod skipper. At times I felt certain that he was holding her up too much. He must lose speed and headway with too great a curb on the bridle. The ground drew closer and closer to his hanging wheels. I saw the rear trenches of the Germans pass below him. I believed he was doomed to strike the next trench, three hundred yards ahead. I wondered if I could possibly render any assistance by flying down and spraying bullets behind him until he had a chance to run to safety. No, such a plan was foolish. There would be a hundred machine-guns turned upon him the instant he crashed. A thousand rifles would be shooting at him from concealed positions. I could not possibly do him any good. The second line of German trenches appeared below the sinking Newport, and I held my breath as the dainty little bird neatly skimmed over them. With rare good fortune, the way ahead seemed comparatively smooth. Loomis might coast along the intervening space and roll smack into the front-line trench of the Huns. There was no doubt about it. He couldn't possibly make another rod. Just at that moment his new poor hit the ground, bounded up, struck again some thirty feet ahead, and with another bound actually hopped over the narrow front-line trench and rolled along some thirty or forty yards across no man's land. I yelled a little to myself in my excitement as I saw Loomis throw himself from the still-moving machine. In a trice he was streaking it for the American trenches, with Bosch bullets accelerating his speed by lifting his heels just ahead of little clouds of dust. Loomis is very fast on his feet, even in flying costume. He covered that hundred yards in something under ten seconds. He left my aeroplane far in the rear, and I had to hurry up to see his finish at the bottom of the front-line American trench. The doughboys covered his last dash with a splendid fuselage of bullets directed into the German trenches. Both sides were standing up and exposing themselves to enemy fire in the excitement of Loomis's home run. I saw him tumble safely into the deepest part of the trench and lie there, probably panting for breath, for apparently he hadn't received a scratch. As I considered this was the end of the morning's entertainment, I put on the gas and pushed on for home. I walked into the adjutant's office and made out a report of what I had seen. An hour later, we were delighted to receive a telephone call from Loomis himself, which instantly relieved our anxiety about his condition. He was entirely well in body, he reported, 
but had not yet fully recovered his breath. Then came another telephone call from the French headquarters, thanking 94 for bringing down one Fokker airplane, whose destruction they would be happy to confirm, and repeating their thanks for the protection Loomis's formation had given their photographers. Very valuable photographs had been obtained, it appeared, both of enemy positions and of the movements of their troops. Within an hour after snapping the photographs, the completed pictures were in their commanding officer's hands. Chapter 22. Our Spods Arrive By August 8, 1918, our whole squadron was fitted out with the machines which we had so long coveted. The delight of the pilots can be imagined. In the meantime, we had lost a number of pilots on the flimsy Newport, not by reason of their breaking up in the air, but because the pilots who handled them feared to put them into essential maneuvers which they were unable to stand. Consequently, our pilots on Newport could not always obtain a favorable position over an enemy, nor safely escape from a dangerous situation. The spods were staunch and strong and could easily outdive the Newport, and our antagonists opposite the Chateau Thierry sector were, as I have indicated, the very best of the German airmen. How greatly our new spods increased our efficiency will be seen from the results which followed. By the 8th of August, our victorious doughboys had pushed back the Hun from the deep Chateau Thierry salient of twenty miles square, and the lines now ran along the Vesle River, directly from Soissons to Rams. This long advance left our aerodrome at Touquin far in the rear. So far, in fact, that it was necessary for our airplanes to come down near the lines and refill with gasoline before continuing our two hours patrol over enemy territory. The old Richthofen aerodrome at Quancy was now in our hands. We established our filling station on this aerodrome. It lay then but eight miles south of the German front trenches. At three o'clock on the afternoon of the 8th, I received orders to take every available plane from our squadron and hurry out to the front to protect two French machines which were detailed to take photographs of an important position across the lines. Accordingly, I collected all the pilots, and we made an immediate departure from the field. Eleven machines were in the flight. The others were not available, by reason of repairs then under way. My ear was again troubling me, and I was in despair over my physical condition. The pain was continuous. I was determined to stick it out, without reporting it to the doctor, for I had the impression that a second appearance at a Paris hospital would end my active service at the front. The cook smuggled hot salt bags to me at night, and I slept with these over my ear. But during the day, and especially while in the air, I felt constant pain from this source. The two Frenchmen met our formation at Quancy, where we all alighted and refilled our tanks. After ten minutes' delay, we again took off, three of my spods failing to get away owing to minor troubles with their motors. This left me with eight machines, besides the two Frenchmen, who were to photograph, and not to fight. At three thousand feet over the field, I collected the formation and fired a red, very light, from my pistol as a signal to forge ahead. I had arranged the formation with the two Frenchmen in the center, with one of my flights on their right, one on their left, and one immediately behind them. I myself flew a thousand yards above them. I anticipated strong opposition upon reaching the lines, but felt that we were posted in a solid position. Only the front center was left unprotected, and little trouble might be expected from this quarter, as the Frenchmen each had two guns pointing to the front. Just as we crossed the lines, all the machines flying along in beautiful formation, I noticed a group of five Fokkers back of Soissons. They were to the west of us, the sun was in the west, and from their maneuvers I knew that they had sighted us and were flying for a position in the sun. Once concealed by the sun's glare, they hoped to approach us and take us by surprise. Keeping one eye upon them and climbing still higher so as to keep well up to their level, I continued to lead my flotilla straight on towards the objective. Reaching Vailly, we began to circle about, while the French spods snapped their cameras. One complete circuit we made, and had started upon the second in order to make duplicates of all the exposures, when I observed three of the Fokkers leave their formation and begin a perpendicular dive upon the photographers. Even as I put down my own nose to intercept them, I was conscious of a feeling of intense surprise and admiration at this exhibition of bravery on the part of the three Huns. They were coming boldly in to attack almost four times their number, and we were still in excellent formation. It would be quite impossible for the three Fokkers to reach the Frenchmen without running the gauntlet of fire from at least twice their number of spods. Evidently these three Heines were pilots of the first quality. As I descended in an oblique to meet the Fokkers, 
I noticed another Fokker formation of five coming straight at us from our rear. So this was the prearranged tactics of their sudden attack. I veered away slightly and looked over the situation. There was no time to lose. We must get rid of these three knights, who had come a-tilting at us with the evident intention of breaking up our formation, just in time for the onslaught of the reinforcements who were coming rapidly to their support. The very first maneuver made by the three Fokkers verified my suspicions. The first tiny came directly at one of the nearest French spots, diving disdainfully through the fire of our nearest protection squad. As he approached within firing distance of the Frenchman, he suddenly did a brilliant renversement and doubled back upon his tracks. Busy as I was at that moment, I couldn't help but admire the daring pilot for his cleverness and coolness. He zoomed up a short distance, turned over on his wing, and this time came down diagonally for a real attack. Our spots were all firing upon him. The Fokker was intent upon the French photographing machine. He did not pay us the compliment of even noticing our presence. I was in exactly the right position to meet his coming, and at the proper moment I pulled my machine straight up on her tail, trained my sights along the line of his dive, and began firing. My bullets cut a straight streak of fire up and down his path, and as the Fokker entered this path, I saw my flaming bullets rip through his machine from stem to stern. By controlling my spa to keep pace with the Fokker, I let go at least a hundred rounds before I saw that my bullets were finally missing him. He must have been literally riddled with bullets. He fell away and dropped, but did not burst into flames. I cast one glance at his two companions and saw that they were being cared for by other members of my flights. Reed Chambers was having a merry set-to with one of them, while the other was at some distance away, endeavoring to rejoin his flight. Chambers had set upon his antagonist with such energy that the Fritz had altered his original intention of taking a shot at the Frenchman. The latter were still under the protection of one of my small formations, and were making their way homewards. Suddenly Reed obtained a favorable position under his Fokker, and with a short burst the enemy machine fell over its wing and began drifting down out of control. Two of the daring Fokker pilots had more than met their match, but had put up one of the most brilliant attacks I had ever witnessed. In the meantime, I was in considerable difficulty myself. From the time of my first shots, I had stalled my motor, and was now drifting through air with a dead propeller, while watching the proceedings above me. I was an easy victim in this condition, should the five Fokkers detect me without power, and the sole method of restarting my motor was a long dive that would force my propeller to revolve through sheer pressure of the air against it. I lost no time in tipping over my wing, and then heading vertically downwards, let my machine rip through the atmosphere for a fifteen hundred foot fall before switching on my spark. The engine mercifully started, and I again pointed up my nose and climbed with all speed to overtake my fellows. The end of the two vanquished Fokkers I had no opportunity to observe. My instructions to my spots had been to stick closely to the French two-seater machines and to protect them across the lines, no matter what happened to any individuals who might be cut off. For some unknown reason, the Fokkers above me did not take advantage of my isolation and made no effort to get me as I flew along in the rear of my formations. Reed Chambers had already caught up with them, and they were all well over our lines. The French machines dropped down to our field at Quancy, while the Spads of 94 continued on their way homewards. Landing beside the French photographers, I inquired as to the success of the expedition, and learned that they had actually snapped thirty-five views of the positions they wanted, in spite of the Fokkers' attack. Upon inspection of the one French two-seater which had been the object of my Fokker's attack, we found that the German airman was as good a shot as he was a pilot. We counted a number of bullet holes in the tail of the machine, none of them fortunately having broken any of the control wires. Our efforts to obtain confirmations of the destruction of the two Fokkers shot down by Chambers and myself were disappointing. Our troops were advancing so rapidly that none of the regiments who were along that sector on the 8th of August could be located when a few days later we drove over to that front to make inquiries. However, one can scarcely expect to get confirmations for all one's victories, since nine-tenths of our combats were necessarily fought on the German side of the lines. My Fokker pilot may have escaped death, and now that the war is over, I most sincerely hope that he did, for he was a brave pilot and a daring fellow. At lunchtime, on August 10th, we received orders for all hands to get aloft at once and form an aerial barrier in front of a small piece of woods that lay just back of our lines, northwest of Fer and Tardenois. This wood was scarcely two miles from the enemy trenches, and our natural supposition was that our generals were filling this area with troops or guns, and desired to conceal the fact from enemy espionage. Upon landing at the Quancy field for refilling with gasoline, we found that our surmises were correct. Large convoys of motor lorries, all cleverly camouflaged to merge with the roads and fields, 
were rapidly passing northwards, and all were packed full of our doughboys. The road kept humming with these convoys all the afternoon. Evidently there was to be a big push on the morrow directed against Fiemes, from this very advantageous position so close to their front. Just as we were getting away, Lieutenant Titus of the 1st Aero Squadron came running up to me and told me that he was ordered to select a flight of our machines to protect him in a photographing mission over Fiemes and the roads leading into it from the north. The Army authorities desired to have the fullest information as to just what the enemy was doing before completing arrangements for the morrow's attack. He asked me if I would pick out a few pilots from my squadron and be ready to go up with him in ten minutes. I asked for volunteers, as this was purely a voluntary mission. Five pilots immediately asked for the job, and we drew our machines apart from the others. Being in command of this expedition, I determined to see to it that a complete understanding existed between our spod pilots and the pilots of the Salmson machines of Number 1 Squadron, who were to do the photographing. The region to be photographed was a large one, covering several towns lying between the Vesla and Ain rivers, and all the highways running between them. It would take some time thoroughly to cover this territory, and we were certain to be attacked before completing the excursion. I talked to the pilots for five minutes, and made everybody understand that when they saw me make a virage, or circle on one wing, just ahead of them, they must immediately make a dive for our lines without any delay, photographs or no photographs. With our experience of the strength of the enemy Fokkers in this sector, it would be senseless suicide for our five machines to attempt to parley with overwhelming numbers of the enemy. It would be useless to get the photographs if we could not return with them. At 5.30 sharp, we left the ground and flew away over Fiemes. At that time, Fiemes was directly on the line. The American troops held the south half of the city, and the German troops occupied the northern half. Fiemes lays just halfway between Hrans and Soissons. We were directly over Fiemes when I detected a formation of eight red-nosed Fokkers stealing around on our left. They had evidently just left their aerodrome and were coming over to patrol the lines. Their present maneuver was as clear as crystal to me. They hoped to get behind us at a superior altitude and then come in upon our rear with the sun at their backs. It was precisely the maneuver I should have attempted in their place. We had the advantage of them in one particular. They did not know how deep we intended going into their territory. I saw by their actions that they intended to overlook us until we were well within their grasp, and then they would suddenly discover us. Very well, I said to myself. We will go ahead and photograph until you are ready to attack. Affecting ignorance of their presence, I continued straight into Germany. We made a short cut from southeast to northwest and came back in the contrary direction. A few discreet circles enabled the photographers to cover fairly well the territory they wanted, without taking us more than six miles within German lines. As we began our second circuit, the Fokkers determined to start something. They had made up their minds that we were not playing fair with them. Five of their machines came darting down upon us from a great altitude, while the remainder continued cruising the lines between us and home. I saw the attack coming, and put my spot in motion at the same instant. Diving down behind my little formation, which was tranquilly pursuing its way northwards, I passed behind the tails of the rear machines, and immediately zoomed up directly in front of them, turning sharply back to the right, so that they could not help seeing me. Without further thought of their possible misunderstanding of this prearranged signal, I began climbing for altitude directly towards the approaching Fokkers. The five enemy machines had their sharp-edged wings cutting the air directly towards me. It is a thrilling and somewhat fearful sight to see the outline of a Fokker biplane descending upon one. I see them in my dreams very frequently after too hearty a supper late at night. Beginning firing at a comparatively long range, I held the spot on its steepest course and waited to discover which side of me the Fokkers would choose to pass. Soon they began firing too, and the swift streaks of fire formed a living path along which we both traveled. I felt deep down in my heart that they would not stop to take me on. Their object was to get the two-seater which had the damaging photographs. They would swerve to my right at the last instant, in order to place me between them and my formation. My spods must be well together and headed downwards towards the lines by now. I had no time to look around, for I was lying back, half upon my back, the earth well under my tail, and the sun under my engine, which prevented it from shining full into my eyes. Almost instinctively I prepared to flatten out and immediately swing over to the right. The enemy must move in that direction. As we whizzed past each other, I ceased firing and flattened out my course. The enemy machines had passed me, and now I had the upper ceiling. They had fortunately continued on down after the Samson, just as I expected them to do. Now the other spads in my flight must look after them, 
Evidently, none of the five had been injured by my fire any more than they had injured me. We each of us presented a very small target subject to injury. As I eased off my motor, I heard the crackling of machine-gun fire below me. I first cast another glance at the distant Fokker formation above me, then looked down over the sides of my office. Surely the five Fokkers could not have reached my spot so soon. They should have been diving for the lines long ago. As I looked down, I discovered a regular dogfight was in progress. Certainly those were Spod machines which were turning and twisting about the encircling Fokkers, and the Spods, in fact, seemed to outnumber the Fokkers. Something strange about the color of the Spods' wings first struck my attention, and then I discovered that this fight was between a French squadron of Spods and another formation of Fokkers that had evidently arrived at the same spot at the same time. Without my being aware of it, two different groups of airplanes had been watching our little party all this while and had all concentrated below me to meet the diving Fokkers. The Salmson and my five Spods were well below me in about the position I expected to find them. The Spods had instantly obeyed my signal and had begun diving even as they headed around to the rear. They were well out of the melee. Considerably chagrined over my lack of caution and thanking my lucky stars again that the new arrivals which had stolen in from an unobserved quarter were part friendly instead of all hostile, I turned about and vindictively charged into the midst of the combat. A Fokker had just zoomed up ahead of a diving Spod, letting the Frenchman proceed below him at headlong speed, when I arrived upon his tail. With my first burst, the Fokker turned over and fell earthwards out of control. Still too angry with myself to think of caution, I was badly scared a moment later by the spectacle of flaming bullets streaking past my face. I dropped over onto my wing, kicked my rudder crosswise, and fell a hundred yards in a vree. No more bullets coming in my direction. I hastily pulled my spot into position and cleaved the air for home. I wanted to get off by myself and think this over. Never again would I venture into hostile skies without twisting my neck in all directions every moment of the flight. That night, after an examination of my machine, I called to my mechanics and directed them to bring me the painter's paints and brush. With painstaking care, I took the brush and drew little circles around three holes in my wings where German bullets had passed through. Cover these holes as neatly as possible, I directed the mechanics and then have the painter put a small Maltese cross over each patch. These are little souvenirs that will remind me of something next time I am over the lines. Chapter 23 Back Close to Verdun One of the extraordinary things about life at the front is the commonplace way in which extraordinary things happen to one. And though one may wonder and be greatly perplexed over it, there are no intervals for giving due thought to the matter. Thus, a day or two after my last experiences, while I was refilling my tank at Quancy, preparatory to another flip over the lines, I met two American doughboys there who told me that my brother was in camp but a few miles north of me. My brother had been at the front with the Signal Corps for three or four months, and though I had repeatedly tried to find his address, I had not been able, up to this time, to locate him. I immediately obtained permission to take an afternoon off, and borrowing a motor car from one of the officers there, I set off to the north in quest of my brother's camp. The roads to the north had but a fortnight ago been in full possession of the enemy troops. Signs along the way pointed out the next village in unmistakable fashion. All were in quaint German script. The Huns had whitewashed the most conspicuous corner at the approach to every village and crossroads, and there upon a white background was painted in high black letters the name of the present locality. A few yards further on was an equally glaring sign pointing out the next point of topographical interest in every direction. The distance in kilometers to each place was indicated with correspondingly large numerals. Any motor driver could pick up his directions without any slackening of speed. The highway I was traversing led to fer en tardenois and had been badly worn by the retreating enemy artillery and wagons. American shells had landed at precise intervals along the line of their retreat. Hurried replacements of surface had evidently been made by the Germans in order to permit the continued use of this road and now our own doughboys were busily at work repairing these same roads, so that our own artillery might go on in pursuit of the fleeing Bosch. As my car approached these groups of busy workers, my chauffeur blew them a long blast of warning. They withdrew to the edge of the road and watched me pass, with an expression of mingled irony and respect. I tried to assume the haunting mien of a major general, while under their brief scrutiny, and was beginning to feel highly pleased with myself, when I suddenly heard one of the doughboys call out, "'Hello, Rick!' I looked around, stopping the car by simply cutting off the spark. An undersized doughboy had dropped his shovel and was running forward to overtake me. 
As he came up, I recognized him as an old friend of mine from my home town. "'Gee whiz, Rick,' he said. "'Where the dickens are you going?' "'Oh, up the road a ways to see my brother,' I replied. "'I just heard he was at the next village. "'How are you, Bob? "'When did you get over here to La Belle France?' "'About a month ago. "'Hell of a way to come. "'To break rock, isn't it? "'Well, so long. "'I've got to get back on the job.' He squeezed my hand and hurried back. I never saw him again. As I proceeded onwards along my way, I continued to marvel at this peculiar coincidence. For months I had been making new friends, had been completely immersed in this new life, had seen nothing of my old friends, and now, within a single hour, I had found myself bumped suddenly alongside my own brother and against an old schoolboy friend. Within another hour we would all be flung widely apart. Perhaps all three of us would become among those reported missing. I began speculating which would be the first. War is a funny thing. After a very brief visit with my brother, I returned home, passing through fair en tardenois and southwards along the same roads I had so recently traversed. Even in the short interval of my passing, a marvellous amount of work had been accomplished. Huge road-rollers were crushing down the gravel, and several miles of the surface had been smoothed. When a people really wanted a good road built, they can finish it in an incredibly short space of time. Along both sides of the highway were piled heterogeneous masses of materials that had been abandoned by the enemy. Our salvage squads were scouring the adjoining fields and woods, collecting and bringing to the roadsides all the valuable articles for transportation to the rear. Other squads were picking up the dead, searching their blood-drenched clothing for data of identification, and stretching them out in methodical rows, duly numbering each corpse and preparing it for the last rites. Rows upon rows of three-inch shells were stacked up within convenient reach of the army lorries, their willow and straw baskets each containing a single German shell, formed a regular row six feet high and fifty feet long. Then came a space filled with huge twelve-inch shells, all standing upright upon their bases. Next were stacked boxes of machine-gun ammunition, hundreds and hundreds of them, occasionally interspersed with stray boxes of rockets, signal flares, very lights, and huge piles of rifles, of machine-guns, and of empty brass shells of various sizes. The value of an average German city lay spread along that road, all worthless to the former owners, all constructed for the purpose of killing their fellow men. I had an unusual experience in the air the following day. It is worth narrating simply to illustrate the extent to which the flight leader of a squadron feels himself morally bound to go. Six of my spads were following me in a morning's patrol over the enemy's lines in the vicinity of Reims. We were well along towards the front when we discovered a number of aeroplanes far above us and somewhat behind our side of the lines. While we made a circle or two, all the while steadily climbing for higher altitude, we observed the darting machines above us exchanging shots at one another. Suddenly the fracas developed into a regular free-for-all. Reaching a slightly higher altitude at a distance of a mile or two to the east of the melee, I collected my formation and headed about for the attack. Just then I noticed that one side had evidently been victorious. Seven airplanes remained together in compact formation. The others had streaked it away, each man for himself. As we drew nearer, we saw that the seven conquerors were in fact enemy machines. There was no doubt about it. They were Fokkers. Their opponents, whether American, French, or British, had been scattered and had fled. The Fokkers had undoubtedly seen our approach, and had very wisely decided to keep their formation together, rather than separate to pursue their former antagonists. They were climbing to keep my squad ever a little below them, while they decided upon their next move. We were seven, and they were seven. It was a lovely morning with clear visibility, and all my pilots, I knew, were keen for a fight. I looked over the skies, and discovered no reason why we shouldn't take them on at any terms they might require. Accordingly, I set our course a little steeper, and continued straight on towards them. The spot is a better climber than the Fokker. Evidently the Bosch pilots opposite us knew this fact. Suddenly the last four in their formation left their line of flight, and began to draw away in the direction of Soissons still climbing. The three Fokkers in front continued towards us for another minute or two. When we were separated by less than a quarter of a mile, the three Heinies decided that they had done enough for their country, and putting down their noses, they began a steep dive for their lines. To follow them was so obvious a thing to do, that I began at once to speculate upon what this maneuver meant to them. The four rear Fokkers were well away by now, but the moment we began to dive after the three ahead of us, they would doubtless be prompt to turn and select a choice position behind our tails. Very well. We would bank upon this expectation of theirs and make our plans accordingly. We were at about 17,000 feet altitude. 
the lines were almost directly under us. Following the three retreating Fokkers at our original level, we soon saw them disappear well back into Germany. Now for the wily four that were probably still climbing for altitude. Arriving over Fiemes, I altered our course and pointed it toward Soissons, and as we flew we gained an additional thousand feet. Exactly upon the scheduled time we perceived approaching us the four Fokkers, who were now satisfied that they had us at a disadvantage, and might either attack or escape as they desired. They were, however, at precisely the same altitude at which we were now flying. Wigwagging my wings as a signal for the attack, I sheared slightly to the north of them to cut off their retreat. They either did not see my maneuver, or else they thought we were friendly airplanes, for they came on dead ahead like a flock of silly geese. At two hundred yards I began firing. Not until we were within fifty yards of each other did the Huns show any signs of breaking. I had singled out the flight leader, and had him nicely within my sights when he suddenly peeked downwards, the rest of his formation immediately following him. At the same instant one of my guns, the one having a double feed, hopelessly jammed, and after a burst of twenty shots or so from the other gun it likewise failed me. There was no time to pull away for repairs. Both my guns were useless. For an instant I considered the advisability of withdrawing while I tried to free the jam, but the opportunity was too good to lose pilots behind me would be thrown into some confusion when I signaled them to carry on without me. And moreover, the enemy pilots would quickly discover my trouble, and would realize that the flight leader was out of the fight. I made up my mind to go through with the fracas without guns, and trust to luck to see the finish. The next instant we were ahead of the quartet, and were engaged in a furious dogfight. Every man was for himself. The Huns were excellent pilots, and seemed to be experienced fighters. Time and again I darted into a good position behind or below a tempting target, with the sole result of compelling the Fritz to alter his course and get out of his position of supposed danger. If he had known I was unarmed, he would have had me at his mercy. As it was, I would no sooner get into a favorable position behind him than he would double about, and the next moment I found myself compelled to look sharp to my own safety. In this manner the whole revolving circus went tumbling across the heavens, always dropping lower and steadily traveling deeper into the German lines. Two of my pilots had abandoned the scrap and turned homewards, Engines or guns had failed them. When at last we had fought down to three thousand feet, and were some four miles behind their lines, I observed two flights of enemy machines coming up from the rear to their rescue. We had none of us secured a single victory, but neither had the Huns. Personally, I began to feel a great longing for home. I dashed out ahead of the foremost spot, and frantically wigwagging him to attention, I turned my little bus towards our lines. With a feeling of great relief, I saw that all four were following me, and that the enemy reinforcements were not in any position to dispute our progress. On the way homeward I struggled with my jammed guns, but to no result. Despite every precaution, these guns will fail a pilot when most needed. I had gone through with a nerve-wracking scrap, peeking upon deadly opponents with a harmless machine. My whole safety had depended upon their not knowing it. This sort of an experience serves to bring home to an aspiring pilot the responsibilities of the flight leader. I considered this fact somewhat seriously as I flew homewards that night and later made out my report. I wanted to be squadron commander, as every other pilot desires this promotion. Yet on this day I began to have an inkling of what it meant to be saddled with such a responsibility. This whole period of what we called the Chateau Thierry show became somewhat chaotic to me. Briefly, it lasted from July 2nd to September 3rd, 1918. I had missed much of it in the hospital. The little flying I had done over the lines had not been especially satisfactory, and now I began to feel a recurrence of my ear trouble, the constant twisting of my neck in air, turning my head from side to side to watch constantly all the points of the compass, had affected in some mysterious way my former malady. On August 18th I suffered actual agony and was unable to get out of bed. This was a sad day for our happy mess. Two of our pilots, one the same Lieutenant Smith that had made so many patrols with me, the other an equally popular fellow, Lieutenant Alexander B. Bruce, of Lawrence, Massachusetts. These two pilots, while patrolling over the enemy's lines at a very high altitude, had collided. With wings torn asunder, both machines had dropped like plummets to the distant ground below. The news came in to us while I was in bed. I had actually just been dreaming that Smith was up with me fighting Fokkers, and I had dreamed that he had just been shot down in flames. When Captain Marr came in to see how I was getting along, he told me about this horrible catastrophe. Smith had appealed to me in many ways. He had told me that he had been in the French ambulance service since early in the war. He had transferred to our aviation when we entered the war. His father had died while he was with us, and he had vainly attempted to get home to see his mother in New York, who was then critically ill. 
but mothers are not considered by those in authority. His application was denied. Bruce I had not known so well, as he had been with us but a few days, but the whole frightful episode really constituted a considerable shock to the nerves of our squadron. Lieutenant Green, who had been leader of this formation, came in a few minutes later and confirmed the sad intelligence we had received by telephone from the French artillery battery which had witnessed the collision in mid-air. Fighters on the front can never understand why the authorities back home deny them necessary arms and ammunition. We air fighters cannot understand why we cannot have parachutes fitted on our airplanes to give the doomed pilot one possible means of escape from this terrible death. Pilots sometimes laugh over the comic end of a comrade shot down in course of a combat. It is a callousness made possible by the continuous horrors of war. If he dies from an attack by an enemy, it is taken as a matter of course but to be killed through a stupid and preventable mistake puts the matter in a very different light. For the past six months, the German airmen had been saving their lives by aeroplane parachutes. A parachute is a very cheap contrivance compared to the cost of training an aviator. Lufbury and a score of other American aviators might have been saved to their country if this matter of aeroplane equipment had been left to experienced pilots. During the following week, Paris surgeons operated upon my troublesome ear at the hospital. It has never bothered me since. As soon as I was able to get about, I maneuvered for my speedy return to the front, for I had heard that the Americans were about to begin a tremendous drive on the San Mihal salient, near Verdun, and that our air force would be of great importance in its success. And it was during this week in the Paris hospital that it was first suggested to me that I should write a book of my experiences in the air. I began this work then and there, and from that time on I kept a more complete diary of my day's work. Naturally, I did not know that the bulk of my victories were to come, nor did I know that I should ever live to receive the command of the best air squadron in the American service. One of the prizes offered by the Duchesse Talleyrand for shooting down enemy machines had come to me. I had more victories to my credit than any other American pilot in our service, though several American aviators, then in French squadrons, exceeded my score. Later, Frank Luke, who was in my opinion the greatest fighting pilot in the war, passed me when he shot down in flames thirteen balloons in six days, a record that has never been equaled by any other pilot. On September 3rd I learned that 94 Squadron had moved back to the Verdun sector. That indicated to me that plans were ripening for the San Mihal offensive by the Americans. I obtained permission to leave the hospital as cured, and hastened to our aviation headquarters to obtain my orders to return to the front. There I was told that General Mitchell's motor car was in Paris ready to be sent back to his headquarters and would I care to drive it back. The quickness of my acceptance can be imagined. My squadron was already at home on the famous old highway that had saved Verdun. About fifteen miles south of Verdun, at a little town named aries le petit the aerodrome covered the crest of a hill that two years before had been in the possession of the Germans. Number 95 Squadron was there, together with 27 Squadron and 147 Squadron. The lines of the enemy ran south from Verdun along the Meuse until they reached saint Mihiel scarcely twelve miles straight east from us. The crump, crump of the guns was constantly in our ears. This aerodrome, which had been constructed and used by the French escadrille, was now to be occupied by our little group until the end of the war. During the coming month of September, I was to win four more victories in the air, and then to be given the greatest honor that has ever come to any pilot, the command of the squadron that he truly believes to be the finest in the whole world, his own. Chapter 24. The San Mihel Drive Although we did not know it at the time, we were now on the last laps of the war. Every taxi driver or waiter in Paris could have told one just where the Americans were concentrating for their great attack on the San Mihel salient. The number of guns, the number of troops, and just where they were located, how many airplanes we had, and similar topics of war interest, were discussed by every man on the streets. Consequently, I was much amused when I was arrested at the outskirts of bar le -Doux by a suspicious member of our military police, the M.P., as he is called at the front, and very closely questioned as to my character and identity. He informed me later that every person entering or leaving bar le -Doux was given the same searching examination. Spies were abroad, and he was taking no chances on letting information leak out as to what was going on. I assured him that I would not tell a soul and was permitted to drive on. These extraordinary precautions always seemed more or less ridiculous to men who had been close to the firing lines during the war. The nearer one gets to the lines, the simpler appears the matter of espionage. 
Doubtless scores of Germans crossed the lines every night, arrayed themselves in the uniform of dead American or French soldiers, and mingled freely and unsuspected with our troops, until they desired to return to their own side. As there are hundreds of our soldiers wandering about looking for their regiments, a few extra wanderers create no suspicion. Yet if one of these should venture to bar le or any other city far away from the actual scene of activities, heaven help him! At the aerodrome I was welcomed by my old friends with a heartiness known only to flying squadrons. A peculiar and lasting friendship is created between boys who fight in the air. No other fraternity upon earth is like it. Jimmy Meisner, I found, was now in command of number 147 squadron. Al Grant of Austin, Texas, had command of 27, succeeding Major Hartney, who had been promoted to the command of the whole group at this aerodrome. 95 squadron was still under Major Peterson, who, with his galaxy of stout fellows, including Bill Taylor, Sumner Sewell, Ted Curtis, Harold Buddy, Jack Mitchell, and Benny Holden, led the four squadrons in their number of victories. This squadron rivalry led to great efforts upon the part of all our fighting flyers. Later, principally through the extraordinary prowess of Frank Luke, his squadron, the 27th, for a time led our group in the number of its victories. But before the end of the war, the highest score came to the squadron, which knew along that they could win it. Old 94, with its hat in the ring. My squadron did a famous lot of fighting during the month of October. It passed the other squadrons of our group, as well as all the other American squadrons at the front. At dinner that night, the night of my arrival, word came to us that the big show was to start at five o'clock the following morning. Precisely at five o'clock, I was awakened by the thundering of thousands of colossal guns. It was September 12, 1918. The San Mihel Drive was on. Leaping out of bed, I put my head outside the tent. We had received orders to be over the lines at daybreak in large formations. It was an exciting moment in my life, as I realized that the great American attack, upon which so many hopes had been fastened, was actually on. I suppose every American in the world wanted to be in that great attack. The very sound of the guns thrilled one, and filled one with excitement. The good reputation of America seemed bound up in the outcome of that attack. Dressing with great haste, I ran over through the rain to the mess hall. There I found groups of the fellows all standing about impatiently, awaiting the chance to get away. But the weather was certainly too bad to attempt any flight to the lines. We were compelled to wait until daylight to see the true state of the heavens. About noon, word came to us that the attack was progressing quite favorably. None of our machines had been able to get up. It was still raining, but the visibility was getting better. We could see that the clouds were nearly a thousand feet above the ground. Taking Reed Chambers one side, I proposed to him that despite the rain, we try a short flip over the lines to see for ourselves what it was like. He agreed, and while the others were at lunch, we climbed into our machines and made off. At six hundred feet above ground, we found that we were just under the clouds and still had quite a long view of the landscape. Flying straight east to San Mihel, we crossed the Meuse River and turned down its valley towards Verdun. Many fires were burning under us as we flew, most of them well on the German side of the river. Villages, haystacks, ammunition dumps, and supplies were being set ablaze by the retreating Huns. We proceeded as far as Verdun. Then, turning east, we continued flying at low altitude and passed over Fresnes and Vignol. Vignol was the objective point of the American forces. It lies east of Verdun, some fifteen miles, and about the same distance north of San Mihel. One American army was pushing towards it from a point just south of Verdun, while the other attack was made from the opposite side of the salient. Like irresistible pincers, the two forces were drawing nearer and nearer to this objective point. The German troops who were still inside the salient would soon be caught inside the pincers. As Reed and I turned south from Vignoul, we saw that the main highway running north to Metz was black with hurrying men and vehicles. Guns, stores, and ammunition were being hauled away to safety with all possible speed. We continued on south through the very heart of the San Mihel salient, flying always low above the roadway which connected Vinol with San Mihel. Here, likewise, we found the Germans in full cry to the rear. One especially attractive target presented itself to us as we flew along this road. A whole battery of Bosch three-inch guns was coming towards us on the double. They covered fully half a mile of the roadway. Dipping down at the head of the column, I sprinkled a few bullets over the leading teams. Horses fell right and left. One driver leaped from his seat and started running for the ditch. Halfway across the road, he threw up his arms and rolled over his face. He had stepped full in front of my stream of machine-gun bullets. 
All down the line we continued our fire, now tilting our airplanes down for a short burst, then zooming back up for a little altitude in which to repeat the performance. The whole column was thrown into the wildest confusion. Horses plunged and broke away. Some were killed and fell in their tracks. Most of the drivers and gunners had taken to the trees before we reached them. Our little visit must have cost them an hour's delay. Passing over San Mihel, we hastened on to our aerodrome. There we immediately telephoned headquarters information of what we had seen, and particularly of the last column of artillery we had shot up in its retreat from San Mihel. This was evidently splendid news, and exactly what GHQ had been anxious to know, for they questioned us closely upon this subject, inquiring whether or not we were convinced that the Germans were actually quitting San Mihel. I assured them that there was no question about the retreat being in full swing. Thereupon they told me that they would immediately begin shelling that road with our long-range guns, so as to further impede the withdrawing of the enemy's supplies along this artery. Later observations which we made over this road indicated that our gunners had made a good job of this task. The Germans had abandoned huge quantities of guns, wagons, and supplies, and had only saved their own skins by taking to the woods and covering the distance to Vinol on foot. The highway was utterly impassable. That same night we were advised that the victorious Americans had taken Tiacor, that scene of so many of our operations back of the lines. A stout enemy squadron had always occupied the Tia Corps aerodrome, and we had had many a combat with its members. Henceforward, we would miss the menace of this opposing unit, and we were also informed that at last Monsec had fallen. Monsec was to this quarter what Vimy Ridge was to the British troops about Lens. Its high crest dominated the entire landscape. From its summit, the Huns could look over the whole south country. From observation posts, which we later discovered on its summit, we saw that our own aerodrome had been under constant surveillance by the Hun observers. Not a machine could leave our field at Toul without being seen by these watchers atop Montsec. No wonder their photographing machines escaped us. Many and many a time we had hurried out to the lines in answer to an alert, only to find that it was a false alarm. Now we understood why we lost them. The Huns had seen our coming, and by signaling their machines had given them warning in time to evade us. They retired and landed, and waited until we had returned home. Then they calmly proceeded with their interrupted work. The capture of Montsec was a remarkably fine bit of strategy, for it was neatly outflanked and pinched out with a very small loss indeed. Our infantry and tank corps accomplished this feat within twenty hours. When one remembers that the French lost nearly thirty thousand men killed, wounded, and missing in their attack on Montsec in the fall of 1916, and then held this dearly bought ground for only twenty minutes, one appreciates what a wonderful victory the American doughboys won. On our trip up this same road the following day, Reed Chambers and I saw the retreat of the Huns and the advance of our doughboys in full swing. The Huns were falling back northwards, with an unusually strong rear guard protecting their retreat. Already they were out of reach of our guns' accurate aim, for the day was again cloudy, with occasional rains, and no airplanes were able to regulate the gunfire. But closely pressing them from behind came our eager doughboys, fighting along like Indians. They scurried from cover to cover, always crouching low as they ran. Throwing themselves flat onto the ground, they would get their rifles into action and spray the Bosch with more bullets until they withdrew from sight. Then another running advance and another furious pumping of lead from the Yanks. Reed and I flew above this scene for many miles, watching the most spectacular free show that ever man gazed upon. It was a desperate game, especially for the Huns, but I cheered and cheered as I caught the excitement of the chase even high over their heads as I was. In the midst of my rejoicing, I suddenly heard the rat-tat-tat of a machine-gun below me, and felt a few hits through my plane. I looked down in amazement, and saw there behind the shell of a ruined building three Germans pointing a machine-gun at me, and pumping away vindictively at my aeroplane. I tipped over my machine into a sharp virage, and grasped my triggers. Before the men could lift a hand, I had my stream of bullets going plump into their center. One man fell dead on the spot, his hands thrust up over his head. The other two dropped their guns and dived for a doorway. I was over the ruined village of Apremont. Coasting along some eight or ten miles further, I saw the whole country was swarming with the retreating Huns. I noted the progress of our own troops below and marked down their positions on my map. Having lost Reed during my little fracas with the machine gunners, I circled westward and covered the Verdun region without seeing anything either of him or of enemy aircraft. When I returned home, I found the weather very bad south of the Meuse, 
and was not surprised at the little air activity in that region. Reed came in an hour or two later. He had landed at our old tool aerodrome to see one of his old pals, and there he had learned the grievous news that David Putnam, America's leading ace, had just been shot down in combat. Since the death of Luffbury and Bayless and the capture of Bear, Putnam, with his twelve victories, had led all the American fighting pilots. His nerve and great fighting ability were well known to all of us. He had once shot down four enemy machines in one fight. Putnam had gone up about noon today with one comrade. They encountered a Fokker formation of eight planes out on patrol and immediately attacked them. Putnam was struck almost at once, and his machine crashed to the ground in flames. Thus died a glorious American boy and a brilliant fighter. The next day was an exciting one for our group. I shot down one of the von Richthofen circus and just escaped getting downed myself. Sumner Sewell, of 95 Squadron, lived through one of the most extraordinary series of accidents I ever heard of, and several others had encounters that yielded a few more victories to our group. It was a clear, fine day, and I took off from the field alone at about 8 o'clock in the morning with the expectation of finding the sky full of airplanes. Anxious to see the extent of the American advance towards Vinul, I made for Tiacor and the north. Tiacor always gave me a shudder in former days, and I usually took care to take a high path over its top. But now I spun across its abandoned aerodrome with much indifference, and for the first time had a good look at its hangar arrangements. Later, crossing the Moselle about four miles north of pont mousson I noticed considerable anti-aircraft shelling up in the direction of Metz. I climbed higher and scanned the sky for machines. Here they come, a large flotilla of American flaming coffins, as their pilots called the Liberty machines, were coming home at 12,000 feet after a bombardment of Metz. And just behind them, and a little above, were four very fast-moving Fokkers. I stuck up my nose and began climbing for the sun. I continued eastward until I had gained about a thousand feet in altitude over the enemy machines, then I turned about. The Huns had followed the American machines to the lines, and then had turned back westward in the direction of the three-fingered lake. This was just the opportunity I had been hoping for. Now I had the sun at my back, and it was unusually brilliant this morning. After a gradual peak with motor half open, I descended to a position within a hundred yards of the last man in their formation. The four were in diamond formation, and none of them had seen my approach. At fifty yards, I pressed my triggers and played my bullet straight into the pilot's seat. His machine slipped over onto its side, and after one wide swoop sideways, began its last long fall to earth. No sooner did my gun begin to crackle, then the leader of the flight swung up his machine in a climbing virage, the other two pilots immediately following his example, and then I received one of the biggest jolts I can remember. We had heard that the famous Richthofen Circus had evacuated its old aerodrome in the west and had been reported in our sector, but so far none of us had met them about here. Now, as these three light Fokkers began simultaneously to come about at me, I found myself staring full into three beautiful scarlet noses headed straight in my direction. It scarcely needed their color to tell me who they were, for the skill with which they all came about so suddenly convinced me that this was no place for me. I had blundered single-handedly into the Richthofen crowd. I did my best to get away in a dignified manner, but a sudden spurt of fire past my nose convinced me that I would be very lucky if I got away with unpunctured skin. The contortions I then undertook must have awakened the admiration of my three pursuers. At odd moments I would try to admire their extraordinary adroitness in handling their machines, for the heavens seemed quite crowded with those three dancing Fokkers. No matter where I turned, there were always at least two of them there before me. I need no more living proof of the flying ability of that celebrated German squadron of fighting pilots. They whipped their machines about me with incredible cleverness. I was looking for an opening for a quick getaway, and they seemed only desirous of keeping me twisting my head off to follow their movements, so I had this slight advantage of them there. At last an opportunity came to try to outrun them, and with motor full open and nose straight down, I looked back and saw them fading away in my rear. I returned to my aerodrome, quite elated with my first victory over this crack-fighting squadron. But Lieutenant Sumner Sewell's experience completely eclipsed mine. Sumner was tranquilly following along at the rear end of his formation, composed of the ninety-five boys, when he was startled by a sudden series of shocks in his aeroplane. He was over the enemy's lines, and some sixteen thousand feet up in the air. He glanced behind him, and found a Fokker immediately upon his tail. The Heine was deliberately riddling Sumner's spot with flaming bullets. The rest of the formation actually drew away from Sewell without knowing that he had been attacked. 
Sewell turned his machine about in a quick renversement, but just as he did so, he felt his heart go into his mouth. The enemy's incendiary bullets had set fire to his fuel tank. With a sudden puff of flame, all the rear part of his machine burst into a furious blaze, and he was almost three miles above ground. Sumner instinctively put down his nose so that the flames would be swept by the wind to the rear and away from his person. Anybody but a Hun would have taken pity on a fellow being in such a plight, and would have turned away his eyes from so frightful a spectacle. But this Fokker Hun was built of sterner stuff. Instead of turning away to attack the rest of the ninety-five formation, Fritz stuck steadfastly on Sumner's tail, firing steadily at him as he descended. One can imagine the mental torture Sumner Sewell endured during the next few minutes. It takes some time to fall three miles, even at the top speed of a two hundred and twenty horsepower motor. The downward motion kept the blaze away from him, but a backward glance informed him that the fire was eating up the entire length of his fuselage, and that at any moment he would be flung out into space. And the same glance assured him that his merciless enemy was leaving nothing to Providence, but was determined to execute him himself. Streaks of flaming bullets passed his head, through his wings and around him on every side, as the Fokker pilot continued his target practice with poor Sewell as his mark. In spite of himself, he was compelled to try a little dodging to escape from so malignant an enemy. Perhaps this very necessity saved Sewell's life. At any rate, it provided a counter-irritant which took his mind off his frightful danger of burning alive. He executed a sudden maneuver when he was but a thousand feet above ground, which moved him out of the range of the German. When he again looked around, he discovered that the Hun had abandoned the chase, apparently satisfied that the Yank was doomed and to his utter amazement he also discovered that the flames were now extinguished. Sumner crashed a few hundred yards on the right side of no man's land. His skeleton of a spod struck a shell hole, executed a somersault, and came to rest at the bottom of another shell hole. Sumner crawled out of the wreckage and looked about him, too bewildered to realize that he was alive and on solid ground. Just at that instant a dull thud at his elbow brought him back to life. He looked at the object at his feet, then at the wreck of his machine. There was no doubt about it. The substance which had made that thud was one of the wheels from his own machine. The German had shot one of his wheels completely away. The fabric which covered the spokes had evidently caused it to swoop this way and that, and Sumner, in his falling airplane, had beaten it to earth. Upon investigation, Lieutenant Sewell discovered that his fuel tank had a hole in its side large enough to admit his fist. An explosive bullet had torn out so large a hole that the gasoline had rapidly run out, and his last maneuver had completely emptied his tank. Such are the fortunes of war.